It, it was until 1987 when Carla and I got serious about wanting to do a zine uh, that looked at things like cyberpunk science fiction and underground comics and brain machines, um, psychedelia. And so we uh, were living in LA at the time when we did it. And um, so uh, we thought, uh, you know, let's interview Robert Anton Wilson, who was a writer we really liked. Let's uh, uh, review like books by Rudy Rucker and William Gibson and Bruce Sterling. And so uh, the name, uh, at the time there were a lot of uh, comic books and some zines that had names that were like sound effects, like honk and blab, um, buzz. And, and so I thought Boing Boing is a good one because I really like the character Gerald McBoing Boing. This time on the Plutopia News Network podcast, Mark Frauenfelder joins John and Scoop in the virtual studio. Mark discusses the creation of Boing Boing, one of the pioneering zines and later a popular blog. We also discuss his work as founding editor of Wired.com, journalism, and much more. Plutopia News Network welcomes Mark Frauenfelder, who's currently research director at the Institute for the Future. Mark's been an influential and vital part of the mainstreaming of the internet over the years. He, he was editor at Wired Magazine and Make Magazine, and he was the founder of the Boing Boing blog. And I, earlier on, before that, he started the popular Boing Boing zine, which the blog was uh, uh, derived from, I guess we would say, it became the web version of the zine and then became the blog. And I actually which remember, you were an editor of. Yeah, I was an editor of the Boing Boing zine. And uh, I remember when you... Well, for one thing, when you moved the zine to the web, which made absolute sense, and then I remember getting an email from you where you were really excited about this new thing called Blogger, and you were going to try it out, and you were going to put Boing Boing on Blogger, and I guess that's where the, the Boing Boing blog got its start. Yeah, it was. It was, it was actually kind of an accident because I was writing – it was in uh, – 1999 and I started learning about web blogs and at that time I think there were like 300 web blogs like cat cataloged from some index and I thought this seems like something that's happening so I was writing on contract for the industry standard magazine at the time oh yeah and I told my editor if I could you know I said I should cover this because I think it's a, an interesting story so they said okay so I interviewed a whole bunch of people who had blogs and then I sent in the article and they're like, well, you know, we don't think that there's really like a business, uh, business readers, you know, the people who read industry standard are interested in internet business. There's not really a, a business kind of, uh, um, application for blogs. So, but as, as part of my like learning, I put Boing, I, I just put Boing Boing on the blogger to see if I could make it work and understand what blogging was about. So even though the article never ran, uh, Boing Boing got it, you know, it moved from being just a static website to a blog. So that ended up being a good thing. I'm glad you mentioned industry standard. I remember the way that I could gauge the impact of the dot-com bust was that industry standard went from being about four inches thick to being like a little skinny <laughs> publication <laughs> before it finally yeah. went away. And that was John, yeah. right? John Battelle? Right. That was Battelle. And the funny thing was that after the industry standard folded, then John, who was a publisher of the Industry Standard, uh, became the ad sales person for Boing Boing. I um, remember that. Federated so, yeah. Media. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So he, yeah, from thinking that blogs, he, he wasn't the one who made the decision to kill the article, but, you know, an editor there did. But uh, anyway, yeah. And so well, you that killed was, one uh, of my articles too for Wired. You remember that? Which one was that about? That was the one where, um, gosh, it was that, it was a, um, it was a book about hackers. Now I can't remember the name of the book. Mm -hmm. I think it was uh, it was one of those it small press books. Anyway, you had sent the thing over to me and I reviewed it. But uh, I mentioned that uh, I was something. We got into some discussion about how I was saying that uh, the Steve Jackson raid was not part of Operation Sun Devil, mm -hmm. and uh, and. Uh, 
you had somebody else who had written an article that said it was part of Operation Sun Devil. And um, I don't know. We had an exchange about that. Mm -hmm. It was Mm -hmm. Josh Quitner that had written the other article. And I think uh, he ended up changing his reference. And and you ended up deciding not to publish the the thing that I wrote. I can't remember exactly why. Uh, Uh, I don't even know why I remember this. That's funny. Um, I, I think Wired probably has one of the high, I don't know if it still does, but back then it had one of the highest kill rates. We've probably assigned two to three times as many pieces as we, we ran, which is not really a good thing to do. And uh, there was also a, and I think this still persists, kind of a, a hierarchy of editors where pieces can go really far down the developmental process before they get nixed by someone at the top, which often happened. I know, I remember somebody wrote a really long, cool article and uh, the editor in chief at the time, I don't want to say who, but it was like fine, ready to go to press. And then the editor said, this has fractals in it. Fractals are old news. We don't want anything <laughs> to do with it. It was like a, a cool thing about like fractal photography and compression. But uh, anyway, that's, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's magazines for you. And oh, yeah. to think well, about it, I mean, look at how Wired is now, speaking of, of skinny magazines, Wired has been at like 96 pages an issue yeah. for the last four or five years, I think. It's just, I think really it's a, a loss leader for uh, the, the conventions that they used to have before the pandemic. It's interesting to hear your exchanges because that reminds me of my time as a field reporter for radio news and the times that I would bring in this marvelous story that <laughs> never <laughs> heard uh, the uh, air. And uh, my favorite one was I came in after a big demonstration where they were using tear gas and I came in wearing a, uh, a, a gas mask and smelling <laughs> like enough tear gas to clear out the office. And it was a great story in my mind. It never <laughs> saw the light of day, but Oh. The good thing about journalists, people generally didn't hold grudges because that's just the nature of the beast. Sometimes it works, sometimes yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. And I have plenty of friends here in um, Los Angeles who make good livings as screenwriters and they've never had a single script uh, produced. You know, it's like a lot of a lot of great stuff never sees the light of day. I, mean, I remember that about some of the science fiction writers that I know who um, were making a lot of money from treatments that never, never mm-hmm. went anywhere. Yeah. I think that's why, uh, you know, our, our mutual friend Bruce Sterling is happy to have his stories optioned and have people look at them and stuff, but he's just, just like, he wants nothing to do with the Hollywood machine because, you know, nine times out of 10, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. Hey, I remember the name of the book that uh, that um, um, that I was going to review that time. Mm-hmm. It was Secrets of a Super Hacker. You Who remember wrote that? It, uh, that it was written by an uh, anonymous author who listed himself as Nightmare, with Night starting as a with a K, K N I G H T M A R E, and uh, it had a uh, an introduction by uh, Gareth Branwyn, our friend. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and I think that's how you stumbled onto it. And I think maybe the reason you decided not to not to uh, run the review of it was partly because of the anonymity. Yeah, that's always a big red flag for any mm-hmm. uh, kind of journalism. When it's uh, yeah. un- uh, unacknowledged, uh, that's kind of a uh, risky place to be. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of a weird it book, is. too. Um, anyway, be that as it may, uh, I want to back up a little bit. I want to a- talk to you about Boing Boing the Zine, um, because I don't think I've ever asked you this question before. What really led you to start a zine? Okay, yeah. So let me let me think about that just a little bit. It really was, um, I think it was probably the whole earth uh, 
a whole earth review at an article by Janine Carlston, I believe is her name. And she wrote an article about zines. And I think this is 1985 or 1986. And it sounded really cool to me, this whole idea that uh, there was this zine of zines called Fact Sheet 5, which was kind of like the Yahoo directory of zines. People would send their zines into this guy named Mike Gunderloy, and he would review hundreds of zines and put out this quarterly zine. And so I ordered a copy of it and just got my yellow highlighter out and just started highlighting all the zines that looked interesting. And then I sent in and ordered them. It was really exciting. I mean, it was a lot like personal blogs in the day, these highly individual, personal uh, publications. And I thought I wanted, uh, it sounded really appealing and fun to me. So I started by doing um, mini comics and I did a few different mini comics and uh, a few like kind of false start zines. Um, and then I, I think it was finally, it, didn't, it was until 1987 when Carla and I got serious about wanting to do a zine uh, that looked at things like cyberpunk science fiction and underground comics and brain machines, um, psychedelia. And so we uh, were living in LA at the time when we did it. And um, so uh, we thought, uh, you know, let's interview Robert Anton Wilson, who was a writer we really liked. Let's uh, uh, review like books by Rudy Rucker and William Gibson and Bruce Sterling. And so uh, the name, at, at the time there were a lot of uh, comic books and some zines that had names that were like sound effects, like honk and blab, um, buzz. And, and so I thought Boing Boing is a good one because I really liked the character Gerald McBoing Boing. Mr. And McGuinness so that was, Buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, a, a UPA cartoon. And I love that kind of mid-century modern uh, art design of the UPA studios. And so that was just a, a good choice for, for us. And then we uh, ended up moving to Colorado while we were producing it. And I think the first issue came out in 1988. And it was like only 32 pages long. And uh, when it came out, um, we really didn't know if we would do another one, but someone saw it in New York, a, a zine distributor, like a magazine, small press magazine dis distributor and asked for a hundred copies of the next issue. And we had done a hundred of the first issue. So we printed 200 copies and Mike Gunderloy reviewed it. And so we basically doubled the circulation of every one, every issue until finally, I think the last issue was issue number 15. And uh, we had a print run of over 17,000. Wow. But the big distributors, good. it was, it was good. But the problem was the big distributors that were d doing zines that was like, I can't remember their names now. There were two of them and they both declared bankruptcy and they owed us. They had not been paying us for a long time. And so we were like left, you know, expecting to get tens of thousands of dollars from them. But yeah, we, we never... were affected by that too. As friends yeah. Of you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. That was one like, of those was distributors was based everybody. here in Austin, right? Yeah. Was it called fine print or what fine was the name of them? It was fine yeah, print. Fine print. Yeah. yeah. I think that they had, uh, I seem to recall hearing that that somebody they had an employee who embezzled some money or something like that. I think that was oh, interesting. The problem that they had, I'm not really so sure. That was kind money. of secondhand. I did. Uh -huh. I, I later worked with somebody who had been uh, part of the team over at Fine Print, mm -hmm. and, and she told me a few stories. That was back in the day when uh, many companies were going under because someone in the senior executive suite was snorting too much Coke. So there were a number of people in the Bay Area that went under like that. I don't think that was their thing, but but um, they had some kind of financial issues. Um, and I also recall that uh, when I first met you, it was through the well, and Mike Gunderloy was on the well too. That's right. And I actually became a host of the Fact Sheet 5 conference with him uh, co-host and I became the book reviewer for fact sheet five and somewhere along the line there you asked me to be fiction editor for boing boing and I don't know yeah, if you remember this definitely. but you sent me the whole big slush file of all the fiction that had been submitted 
And yeah. I wrote you back and told, I read through it and I said, I think you shouldn't take submissions of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was some, yeah. That was, that the, was uh, the early days of fan fiction, I guess. Exactly. That's so I, I moved from the editorship to being the cyborganic jive meister. That's right. I love it. <laughs> Those were the days. That's right. So, well, yeah. so, so you were publishing the zine and, and you had a pretty good run with it, maybe not making a lot of money with it. And then uh, at what point did you get on with Wired? Let's see. That was in, uh, they had called me in like ni- late 1992, I think, or early 93 about like before they published the first issue, they were like looking for managing editor. And so um, they interviewed me for it, but they ended up giving the job to John Battelle, which was a good choice because he had a lot of magazine experience in like, you know, real magazines with ad sales and, you know, kind of managerial <clears throat> experience. And so he got the job and then, but I, I wrote for them from the first issue. And then by the third issue, they were growing. And so they asked me if I'd like to come on at, as an associate editor. And so we moved from Los Angeles to, uh, to San Francisco. And I worked there at the office and um, the, the, the building that we were in, there was space below on the first floor and they kindly let, it wasn't wired, but it was a guy who, who owned that space down there. And he let us get, gave us a, a corner office. I think it was like a hundred dollars a month or it was free or something. I remember and that Carla, office took over the editor like ran the magazine while I was working upstairs at wired and uh and so that yeah so then I stayed at wired from like 1993 until 1998 and um was like work on the magazine for a couple of years and then uh I uh th- then they wanted to you know the, the web was happening and they had started hot wired and, but they wanted to give uh Wired the magazine a present, so they asked me if I would like to be the editor in chief of Wired.com, and so I did that uh, for a year or so, and then they started a book division, like a book publishing company called Hardwired, and I worked there, which was fun. And one of the cool things that I, I did there that that I liked was a lot of the old out of print cyberpunk short stories and novels. I got uh, contacted all the authors like John Shirley and Rudy Rucker and Charles Platt, um, I think Mark Laidlaw, and republished their work in a line and, and a, a, like a series of like, you know, new editions with new introductions and things like that. So were you were you still associated with Wired when Condé Nast took over? Um, I think so. I was. Uh, I stopped working there in 1998, and I am pretty sure they had been purchased. No, they were actually owned by Lycos for a while. Oh, okay. Yeah, Lycos, and then uh, Condé Nast bought them from Lycos. So I wasn't actually there in the Condé Nast era, which is still the owner. Well, when I first became uh, really aware of Wired, was when uh, I found that uh, Wired was starting to buy up all these sites that I really liked and the web services. Who was behind all the acquisitions that uh, started to happen? Let's see. Um, that, that was probably later. Like, why you started Hot Wired? I don't I, oh, I guess they were like acquiring some things like, like suck.com was actually started internally by by some hot wired employees who just kind of moonlighted and were doing it at night and wired bought it from them um so i i, guess, I would guess lewis Rossetto and jane metcalf the, the founders of wired probably did some acquisition and then when chris anderson was editor-in-chief later he probably he's very savvy he probably bought some some sites too i think we're wired really kind of missed out was they started a search engine called Hotwired, and um, it was competing with Alta Vista at the time. If you remember that search engine, it was kind of like yeah. pre Google. But they they had a lot of uh, they had a lot of market share early on, but they just didn't follow up with the tech development 
and then Google with its page rank algorithm really like blew everything else out of the water. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, they were much better than that. Killed Vista. everything. Yeah, I remember yeah. that there was even a. Uh, I started getting emails from Wired's uh, travel services. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now. Uh, oh wow. I didn't know they had a travel service. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't amazing. know if it's travel or yeah, you know, it was uh, something monkey. I forget <laughs> the name. Oh yeah, uh, like Code. I think Code Monkey or something like yeah. that. They had like a site for like developers. Yeah, that was Code Monkey. I remember that too. I worked at Hotwired for a while. I was running a, a for Electronic Frontiers forum, which oh, was really kind of um, it's kind of like a, an online discussion uh kind of a chat based discussion that we would do weekly for an hour i think it was and i would bring in a guest um it was kind of, i mean that was kind of an interesting gig um went yeah. on for a while they actually um uh, <laughs> they uh, they they hired me they were going to hire me to be a forum moderator in addition mm -hmm. to the work I was doing with the Electronic Frontiers Forum. Um, and uh, it bothered them that when I started working as a forum moderator, I was actually starting to inject myself into the conversations because my history in doing that kind of work was at the well, you know, where you would be a, mm -hmm. a, a host and you would try to move the conversation along. And their mm -hmm. idea was you would be more like a monitor. You would be silent and in the background, and you would only step in if you had to break up a fight, I guess, or something. Oh, interesting. Um, so it was not yeah. a participatory kind of a thing. Yeah, exactly. So um, we sort of parted ways over that. Uh, I mean, I would have done what they wanted me to do, but it wasn't going to be very interesting. You know, it was yeah. going to be kind of a dull job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's probably good that you... Um, yeah, I, I, uh, it's kind of sad to see like some of the, the original people who were kind of long-term, uh, contributors like Bruce Sterling, they, they killed his blog that he'd been doing for many years. That was just a little while ago. And Gareth did the, uh, jargon watch column that was like looking at new words and stuff like that. And they got rid of that. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, things change and, uh, they have their decisions about how they want it, the direction they want to take magazines in. So I guess that makes sense. Well, so after you left Wired, at some point you, uh, you got involved with O'Reilly and Make. Was that, uh, that was in the later 2000s, right? Yeah, that was, uh, let's see, that was in two th late 2000. Uh, like, let's see, it was around 2003, around 2003. And again, it was uh, John Battelle um, was uh, talking to Dale Doherty, one of the co-founders of O'Reilly. And because Dale had called him in, Dale was the an editor there at O'Reilly and one of the founders. And he had been doing a series of books called the Hacks books that were kind of about hardware hacking. And he had things like eBay hacks, Amazon hacks baseball hacks like and so he wanted to create a magazine a general interest magazine about making things which i thought i mean it was such a great idea and so uh, john called me uh and asked if i would be interested in helping with it and so i met i came up there and met with dale and uh he asked me to put together a prototype of what the magazine might look like like a like a 50 page mini issue of what the magazine might be and so we brainstormed on a name um dale was the one who came up with the name make which um i wasn't so sure of at first but it turned out to be such a great name um and so i i hired a, a, a designer that i really liked this guy named david albertson who uh, did a lot of design work for the ted conferences and uh did some work for a, a wired spin-off magazine and so i basically camped out at david albertson's office for about two and a half weeks and we made a, a fake early issue of of make magazine and dale would come up once a week or so and review the pages taped to the wall 
And so he, I thought, you know, it was just a one-off gig. He was going to pay me to produce this prototype. And, and then, you know, it was like, all right, have fun, you guys, with it. But he ended up calling and asking if I'd like to stay on as the editor in chief of it. And I loved the idea so much that I did. And I was there from, I think, like, two thousand, you know, late 2003 or early 2004 up until, I think maybe 2014. It was like, so I was there about 10 years, or maybe it was even 12 years. It might have been until 2016. It gets kind of hazy. It seems like it was <laughs> a pretty point. long run. So did yeah. you consider yourself a maker? Um, less at first and then more as I went on. And I think it was because I was just around these people who, were makers and at first I was like just so impressed and intimidated by how good they were at making things um, everything from furniture to electronics uh, and everything in between that I just thought there's no way I could ever uh, you know make something that would be comparable and what I did learn though from like working with these people and visiting them and seeing them at maker fairs was that like their their super skill wasn't as much talent as it was a about not being afraid to make mistakes and just being persistent and like accepting mistakes and, and learning from them. And that a lot of it is just trial and error and just, you know, endless iterations and prototypes and starting over. And so once I allowed, gave myself the freedom to like just screw up over and over and over again, um, I was able to like really enjoy the process of making. And now it, it is like a pretty, significant part of my life i have like a, a laser cutter and a 3d printer and uh, a bunch of tools and so i still do everything from you know lots of electronics projects with raspberry pis and arduinos um to uh you know uh, whittling spoons which is you know i have like a bunch of wood and some carving tools that i have outside on my porch and i'll just take a break and, and just you know carve a spoon for five or ten minutes while I wait for my coffee to get cool enough to drink. I like what, what you said. Would make, would make Magazine right now, is it still being published? Yeah, it's still being published. I know the Maker Fair stopped, right? They're not doing Maker yeah, Fair anymore? Yeah, unfortunately. Um, I, you know, they're working on trying to get it going again, but so, so basically, um, you know, they, they, they went under in a way, I mean, they, they kind of folded make for a month or two and Dale um, was able to get the, get the trade mark for it um, and, and own it just himself. And so he has restarted it and he's doing it. It's not a nonprofit, but I think that's probably something that, you know, he would be wanting to look into. And so um, it's around and it's still being published. And I think that, uh, you know, make, there's still maker fairs around the world. Oh, they still have one in make, Austin. That's good. Yeah, so I think they license the name. You know, you can have mini maker fairs. Kind of, there's like exactly. a TEDx kind of model, and then there's like you know a more official model where I think they pay a licensing fee and they get, you know, best practices and cons consultation and all that kind of stuff. So it's still going, which I'm, I'm really glad to hear. I know it was and, an expensive event to put on. Yeah, and it's all—it's also really dependent on getting large corporate sponsors. And if you—if one or two big sponsors drop out, it really like affects the bottom line in a severe way. And so that's you know that's the hard thing. And if if there's like a kind of a dry year, then it's a big hit. Yeah, there was a Plutopia event at one time. One of our large corporate sponsors was Make Magazine, by the way. Early oh, really? on, I think our first cool. our first Plutopia. And I think That's I talked so over cool. uh, a Scoop a minute ago. Scoop, you were going to well, say something. I was just uh, impressed by what you said about not being afraid to fail. And that's something that doesn't get taught enough to people. So many people are... Uh, indoctrinated that you you can't fail you but you have to get it right all the time yeah. and I've gotten some of my best knowledge from screwing up and it stays so with you a lot longer than uh, getting it right you know getting it right is great and uh, you know you, you should get it right when you can but being afraid to fail prevents so many people from uh, uh, 
uh, going further in whatever it is they do, it, it doesn't really matter what field you're in. And I've, so. I've taught that to people that I've trained in, in studio work and even back in my reporting days, of, don't be afraid. Just go and do it. And if you screw up, learn from it. You yeah. know, as Sunryu Suzuki Roshi, the Zen master, used to say that life is one continuous mistake. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that. And I think, you know, one of the problems is that, that uh, kids are taught in school uh, to, you know, that, that mistakes equal a bad grade. And that's like bad training because then, you know, you, you go through life thinking that mistakes equate to something that's really a negative thing that can hurt you. And it's so, I think the grading system is a bad system. And, you know, there's a lot of problems with the way that the educational system works, of course, but the grades are like a big problem with it, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think there's two kinds of people in this world. There's people who are, kind of honest about their mistakes and then there's people who hide their mistakes but there's mm-hmm. not only people who don't make mistakes <laughs> yeah that's well, true well they we have a do. we have a president that doesn't make any mistakes according to uh <laughs> yeah. his press releases yeah. <laughs> exactly i know I, I just imagine if if he were like ever willing to to admit to making mistakes um I think that uh, it would, that would make such a huge difference in in his effectiveness as a leader and the way he's perceived. But the fact that he won't ever do that makes him really, you know, much more dangerous. Yes, John and I have been uh, attending a uh, webinar this week of International Society for Online Journalism, listening the International to International Symposium. For oh, yes, yes, symposium, and. They have journalists from all uh, over the world talking about COVID-19 and uh, other subjects, but that's been a big f- focus of just about everything I've listened to lately is, you know, these journalists are puzzled at what's going on in our country. And, you know, they had people from Germany, you know, the only one uh, ones that uh, weren't too puzzled were the journalists from India and Brazil, which are having similar problems that we've experienced here. Yeah. And they have I know similar it's, governance. It's, it's so, it's, it's really sad. And I, it's that, that kind of stubbornness that a lot of people have not wearing masks. Like I, I've been to Japan quite a few times and even before the, the pandemic, people wore masks. And so they're just, they were totally on board. Everyone wears masks there and They've had the entire country has had fewer than a thousand deaths, and the unemployment rate is like two and a, less than two and a half percent. And look at the difference; it's insane. Oh, yeah. Well, it's in crazy. your work at the Institute for the Future, how has that work changed since March? Um. Well, yeah, I mean, it's changed in a big way. It's all, but the office is all but closed down. We have a, an office in Palo Alto, California, but you know we don't allow any. We, we only allow like one person in there at a time, and it's usually our our art director who is you know wants to just have like the giant screen and a color printer. But other than that, everyone is using Zoom. All of our work, our our workshops that we do are all done using Zoom. We we've started using this app called Miro M I R O which is this amazing, I mean, if I say whiteboard, that's short selling it too much because there's just this kind of infinitely expandable space to put uh, interactive uh, workshops together and people can collaborate, you can break off into subgroups, but it's done in such a way to make it really intuitive and not complicated. Um, And so starting to use Miro is like, it's just been such a great way to really make workshops that used to be live and in person uh, work just as well uh, in, you know, virtually. And maybe I shouldn't say just as well, effectively uh, and in different, you know, in a different way, but, but very effective still at the same time. So we've been doing that and, you know, our, uh, 
our other work for other clients, a lot of times are reports um, and we're able to do that and do all of our interviews, you know, analysis and all that kind of stuff just collaboratively. I spend much more time on Zoom than I ever have, you know, doing video conferences, which is can be a little exhausting at times. You know, how do you guys feel about constantly being on video? Uh, we're kind of used to it. I mean, I've been working with, so I was part of a co-op until recently, until I retired from that. And um, we had all of our meetings uh, using Zoom, using video, mm-hmm. and had done mm-hmm. that for years, really. Yeah, we- um, and then Scoop and I have done, we did a, a large percentage of our interviews uh, using Zoom because we would so often inter- interview people who were, you know, remote from our from Austin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the early um, days, we started out with Skype, which was uh, oh, yeah, yeah. interesting. But I mean, <laughs> we listened in uh, today is, is a, a webinar. They had NBC's uh, people talking about their change from having all the massive camera crews and live stuff out there to working the way we've been working since like 2010. So it was interesting hearing that. I'm like, well, I remember those days when we had to figure out how to do these interviews uh, over the internet. But we're, mm-hmm. it, it's quite comfortable. Yeah, I prefer going. I'm, I'm an old beat reporter from back in the radio days, and I like going out and being face-to-face with the person you're interviewing. You get so much more of a read for where they're coming from and where they're going by being in person. But with the uh, Zoom camera, I mean, it's pretty close. I can can see you quite well, so uh, Mm -hmm. it it works. But I'd sure like to be out there. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Well, hopefully we will be able to again soon. Uh, You know, I was just answering a question on a survey today, uh, one of those Pew surveys where they... Uh, one of the things that I, they're wondering about is how will whatever is going on now have an impact on technology? And, uh, and they made me think about it. And, and what I was thinking is that this is probably here to stay. And, and a, a concern about even if the coronavirus is managed to some extent, uh, I think that we're sufficiently snake bit that we're going to, continue to be concerned about other possible vectors of exposure to other things. And that, um, some of the, some of the things that we're doing now, like wearing masks and, and having virtual conversations and meetings will probably stick to some extent. Mm-hmm. We'll probably I think you're probably it. right. Yeah. Do uh, do you actually do strategic foresight work yourself, or are you more managing and coordinating? Um, I do some strategic foresight. I do. Um, I'm also the editorial director there, so I'm responsible for all the deliverables. You know, everything that we produce, just making sure that the uh, you know you know the editorial integrity is there and. Uh, so I, I help with that. I help with, uh, you know, production, uh, design, all that stuff. But I also do, you know, some research and I'll, you know, do expert interviews and uh, signal scanning, um, synthesis, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's a small company. So a lot of people wear a lot of different hats. One of the yeah. things I keep hearing on this webinar is the concept of, flattening the organization and I, I re- recall that from back in the day when offshoring became the big thing everybody wanted to flatten the local organization which means you, you have less people to pay less mouth mouths to feed and i have a feeling yeah. we're headed in that same direction in in many industries of people go well you know we were able to do that with this few people uh do we need to bring all these folks back are you hearing that yeah. sort of thing? I think so. I mean, you know, this is coming at a time when the the whole kind of gig economy uh, marketplace has been growing and evolving. Uh, and so I think we'll start to see more and more of this kind of 
you know, marketplaces for automatically, you know, finding who you need to get a job done. And, you know, companies will expand and contract on an as needed basis. And that's why I think it's really more important than ever to think about things like, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the current wealth and equity issues that we have, uh, benefits, um, uh, health care, all these kinds of things, which, you know, in decades past, certain segments of the population did have a, a semblance of security. I think we have a challenge, opportunity, and a duty now to see what we can do to uh, make life more equitable for for everybody. And maybe there is a way to combine gig economy with things like portable benefits so that if you, you know, do something for TaskRabbit or Uber or uh, Upwork, that that all uh, is kind of uh, combined in a way that the work you put into it goes, to, you know, you, you get some kind of benefits, or, you know, retirement or an investment plan or something like that. I think there's possibilities out there. It's going to take a ton of work to do, but it's, you know, no time like the present to start exploring that, especially when we are, are kind of in, in shock in a way that allows us to think, you know, let's, let's uh, think what we can do with a, with a blank slate here and make this work. That's a very good point. I have a friend actually uh, in the uh, Bay Area who never really worked for anyone other than himself and he's at retirement age and realizing that he really doesn't have the benefits of the like you know people who worked for a company and had social security and all that coming to them and uh that's, that's what i see happening to the gig economy is people are working but they're not getting any benefits for later on yeah I yeah, think so. There's, oh, go ahead, John. No, I was just going to say the, the company that you worked for at one point in this country was sort of like uh, your home and family. You know, it, it mm-hmm. was, it it was providing you more than just a place where you went to work every day and drew a paycheck. They they did more to take care of you, and you really felt it sense that you belong there, and that's sort of disappearing now, and I think. Uh, I mean, several years ago, uh, I took my own sole proprietorship and turned it into a cooperative and uh, I had other people who came in as members. And to me, that is a good step forward, Uh, something Mm -hmm. that we might do as an alternative to the way things were done before and, and especially as an alternative to the way things are being done commonly now is to form cooperatives and in cooperatives, everybody's an owner and all the people can be dedicated to the good of everybody else. You know, I love that idea. And it's, it, it kind of, uh, is more of, it's a better solution. I think than guaranteed basic ins income is kind of like a, a continual hand to mouth solution, but guaranteed basic assets where you have actual ownership of, of, uh, in, you know, shared intellectual property, physical property, real estate, um, uh, you know, your own data that, that uh, these uh, social media platforms own. Having that kind of ownership, so you have guaranteed basic assets, that is, is I think, a secret sauce, and cooperatives could be a, a big part of that solution. Yeah, it's, it's a for some people it could be a difficult path and, and it has, you know, its own set of gotchas. Mm-hmm, uh, one mm-hmm. thing is that if everybody's an owner, you really have to make sure everybody sort of fits together and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, it's a, it's a very sane way to, to hold yourself within uh, some kind of enterprise and you can make money just like you can make money with other with other kinds of business, you're not going to have the one guy at the top who's making millions more than anybody else in the company. 
but that right. income will be distributed in such a way that everybody is okay, you know? Yeah, I think that's good. And, and that's also like one other thing that's crazy about the U.S. is that, you know, the difference in percentage of how much the CEO makes is like many, many multiples of the rank and file employees. But like Japan, it's it's really like much, there's much less uh, disparity between the the CEO and the other employees. And so that's that's another thing that that ought to be corrected. They just published a list of the uh, highest paid uh, people in education and upper management, you know, the, you know, the chancellors and presidents of various universities. And Texas had you know, a large portion of that list, people that were heading up, you know, University of Texas or Texas A&M making, you know, a million and a half a year. And uh, you talk to the people that are teaching in those institutions, they're not anywhere close to that. So Scoop, the football yeah. coach makes $5 million a year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a, an, uh, student debt is another huge, huge, huge problem where young people just starting out in life are saddled with debt that they won't pay, be able to pay off for decades. That's a, a, a ridiculous yeah, it was great that Bernie was trying to address that, and I hope that yeah. some of that filters into, assuming that Biden is elected president, that, mm-hmm. I mean, somehow that needs to be reformed. Uh, I know when I was going to school, you accumulated some debt, but I didn't have unmanageable debt, you know, from mm-hmm. from my student loans, and we were able to get grants as well as loans, you know, that would right. offset some of that. Yeah. It's not like that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. My grandson always tells me that he he, he doesn't want to go to college because uh, um, he's afraid that he'll be saddled with debt for the rest of his life. And that's yeah, probably true. That's, I show my age true. when I tell people I paid $75 a quarter for you know, <laughs> tuition at the University of North Texas, which was, you know, even then a uh, well-known university. But you go there now and uh, you can probably buy a nice Maserati with what you spend. Yeah. Isn't so, it crazy? So Mark, I, I did some work with uh, governance futures lab at, uh, at IFTF. And, uh, I'm wondering if they're still operating and if there's still a lot of meetings going on about potential scenarios for governance. Um, there is, uh, but I don't think there's a, a great deal that's like active at the moment. But, uh, you know, in recent years we have. Um, right now we're looking, kind of looking at like post-pandemic scenarios that do inclo- include some kind of, you know, new governance models and things like that. Um, but uh, that's, uh, yeah, th- there's nothing that's big right now, actually, that, that I, that I, can recall offhand. Well, what does a generic pro- post-pandemic scenario sound like? Um, well, I mean, you know, one one thing that we we do is like there's this kind of traditional way of looking at at four different scenarios. One is uh, you know growth, uh, another is constraint, another is collapse, and another is transformation. So that we have uh, four different stories that kind of look at, you know, what would happen if this pandemic just gets worse and worse and worse with no end in sight, what happens if uh, it gets under control, but never eradicates, uh, what happens if, you know, something completely, un, you know, kind of thinkable happens almost like a transformational thing. Um, and then, uh, uh, I can't remember the fourth one, but anyway, so, uh, they, you know, what, what we do is um, to create those and we talk to experts uh, in a whole bunch of different fields, everything from art, uh, science, uh, uh, the economy, and get their take on things and ask them what's possible, what's probable, um, and then start thinking of like second order effects, um, like what happens as a result of, you know, uh, schools staying closed 
for the next four years? Like what, what are some second order effects of that? Like how would businesses change? How would transportation change? And then once we do all that kind of stuff, then we write these scenarios and they could be anywhere from, you know, like 500 words to 5,000 words. We might give that information or findings to a science fiction writer and tell her to him or her to um, write a, a science fiction story based on that. And so the idea is not really to predict the future, but to kind of like uh, stretch thinking and uh, kind of help organizations become future ready by showing them what's possible, uh, what's, what's uh, you know, potentially likely to happen. Um, so I don't know if that completely answered your question, but that's kind of the process. And we're actually, one reason I can't give you a specific example yet is we don't really have all the, the scenarios completely developed yet. But I do think they'll be public when they come out um, and they should be out pretty soon in the next month or two. And, and you would be able to check them out at the website, which is iftf.org. That'd be great. I always thought that that the real purpose of at least when you're doing like corporate futurism is to lay out some scenarios to be kind of like a map. And then like if you're doing it for a corporation and you're focusing on their industry, they can kind of get a sense of where their industry could be going and it gives them a way to make some decisions and take some actions partly to create the future that makes the most sense to them. Mm -hmm. That's a really great way to, to, to describe that, John. So is anyone doing a scenario, you know, the ultimate scenario of, well, what do we do now that the dystopian nightmare is here and we can't get rid of it? Um, I think that uh, as far as I know, you know, no, but uh, that, that is something that, that should be explored, you know, along with the, the other possibility of being hit with some other kind of a pandemic at the same time, like a, you know, some kind of flu, another flu or some other ep epidemiological uh, event. What, how would that affect things? That would be pretty bad. It could be. And, you know, we have flu season coming up, so there will inevitably yeah. be cases of flu interspersed with the yeah. existing COVID cases, which are just getting worse right now. Yeah, I saw a I map know, I today just... that showed that every, pretty much with very few exceptions, almost every state in the country is either having an uptick, uptick or a, a, a real surge. Yeah, I, I think um, the last time I checked, we are we're on track today to have more deaths uh, today than any time since like the end of May. So it's, it's definitely going back up. Yeah. It's hard to feel chill for cheerful, right? Now. <laughs> yeah, it really is. So you're living, are, you're living in LA now? Yeah. Still? We're here in Los, yeah. We've been here for quite a while and uh, we, we enjoy it. Um, Carla's my wife's uh, mother lives here and her sister so we have family um, we have friends here we work uh, from home so we don't need to, to deal with the commute which is great and in fact I mean one you know as horrible as this pandemic has been for, for us you know like one upside is that we have to drive even less than we have before and so that's nice we just take a lot of walks spend a lot of time in our backyard we don't go to restaurants or anything like that. Uh, we, we kind of minimize as much as possible. Um, so is LA handling this in a pretty sane way? Is it, mm, are they keeping cases down? I don't, I, uh, no, they're not. <laughs> LA County, I think is doing really bad. And I, I just, I just shake my head whenever on those occasions when I do have to get in the car, um, you know, maybe once a week or so. And I drive past the restaurants they're filled with people, but you know, the outdoor seating for a while they were having like limited indoor seating, but they're just packed. No one's wearing masks. And I'm just thinking this is, this is not good. I just read that, uh, LA County has had 5,700 stolen vehicles just in the months of April and May, which is like the greatest number in the recent decades. And one wow. of the reasons is, you can't go to jail when they you, 
you've probably seen all the police chases that have been so mm-hmm. popular on LA TV. Mm-hmm. We even get them online. And mm-hmm. lately, the sheriff and the LAPD don't really stick with it very long because they know that as soon as this person is arrested, they're, cita- they're given a citation and sent out to, to the streets because they don't want to put them into jail. So the word oh, has gotten out, it's okay to steal because all you can do is get a ticket. It's like, oh the, my God. It's like marijuana oh my God. used to be. You used to go to jail for it, but then they started giving you parking tickets for it. Yeah. So it's like car theft has been decriminalized. Pretty much just by <laughs> the nature of the beast that we're in. That's amazing. You well, know, these are strange times for sure. Yeah. Well, I think we, I think we're kind of uh, at the end of our time here, Mark, and uh, okay. really appreciate you joining yeah. us. And we it's hope you'll so come back sometime. You guys. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you so much. You may follow Mark's work at boingboing.net or on Twitter as at Freudenfelder. You can stay in touch with Plutopia at plutopia.io. On Facebook, look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lubkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future. <laughs>